Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lars Rangbeck and uh, I work as a consultant uh, at a small company called up to change I've been working with uh, data in all shapes and forms uh, for over 20 years now and uh, I'm also a part-time researcher at Stockholm University within the field of information modeling and my research is focusing or lately anyway has been focusing on information that is sort of more true to life, uh, the true nature of information. Uh, because the information that we usually see in databases uh, is information that plays very nice. Uh, it's sort of the Facebook version of, of data. Um, it looks nice, has lots of friends, and absolutely no issues uh, whatsoever. And that's not really the way information is in general. If you think about information in general, it's often subjective, it's opinionated, uh, and everything like that. So, so information in itself is quite more messy than what we are used to seeing as uh, professionals within uh, the database field. <clears throat> Today I will be talking about a new type of database. and This database is called Bearclad. And it's a database that I have uh, been building. It's, uh, you could say that it's sort of the pinnacle of all of the research that I've been doing over the years. It's all sort of uh, coming together into this product. And the idea here is to capture uh, reality a little bit better than you can with uh, traditional databases. Uh, it also has uh, one um, feature that is a little bit different from other databases and that's we try to model uh, as little as possible up front so you can quickly get information into the database sort of bare data and then once it's in the database you start to dress this data up with additional context so that's where the database gets its uh, name, bare clad. Of course, uh, building a database uh, is no easy task. And uh, so far, it's been just me building uh, this database. And I probably didn't really know what I was getting myself into when I started this. Um, I've been doing lots of programming also over the years in many different languages. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely no novice when it comes to programming. Uh, even so, uh, building a database, uh, I think proved to be quite of the most challenging programming exercises that I've uh, ever done. And it's the database is not complete yet either. So, um, <clears throat> but there's been a lot of things that I had to figure out uh, along the way that I wasn't really prepared for actually. And I guess that's sort of the pains of uh, building a database engine. Um, one example is of course uh, that um, I had quite lofty goals for this database when I started out, and I had to reduce these uh, along the way if I'm ever going to have something that resembles a finished product. Uh, but I wanted it to be some kind of MPP uh, database that was uh, top-notch, state-of-the-art, uh, could handle like uh, gazillions of data. But um, I've sort of scaled that down, and right now I'm happy if I have uh, an in-memory database that can run on a single computer. Um, so that's where I am at right now when it comes to goals of the database. Of course, being an in-memory database, you don't really want the data to disappear if you suddenly shut off the computer or shut down the database. You need to be able to spin it back up and, and uh, keep your data, of course. Um, and that, that, of course, uh, comes with some additional concerns and, and uh, requirements. So what I had to do here was to figure out some good way to also add persistence into this database. The in-memory structure is a hypergraph, and it's implemented through like a lot of lookup tables, uh, smartly indexed within the ROM memory of the computer. 
Um, but the on disk storage um, is uh, actually uh, another database. It's SQL Lite. I figured since I'm uh, quite well versed in relational databases, um, this was a, a good choice and I can start with this. Um, it's maybe not the most performant one, but uh, you don't sacrifice much uh, because you only sacrifice a little bit of performance when you write data into BearCloud. Uh, when, when you read data, you only read from the hypergraph and not from disk. So, and of course, when you start up the database, it will read what's on disk and read it into memory. One of the first things I had to decide upon, and I started this a few years ago, uh, was which program, programming language to use when I um, was going to build this database. Um, I had been programming in Java, JavaScript, uh, C, uh, .NET, um, so um, I had a background having seen quite a few programming languages. But I felt that neither of them was a perfect fit for a database, given that it, you have extremely high demands upon performance. Uh, and I really wanted this also to shine when it comes to performance. Uh, so I started looking into what uh, different languages were out there. Uh, I mean, immediately if you think about performance, at least uh, what, many years ago, it would probably have fallen upon C or C++. Um, but I, I had this um, feeling in the back of my mind that probably something had come along after that. Uh, so I started looking uh, on the internet and trying to find information about new programming languages and if they were having like reasonable amount of followers and, and uh, being maintained and developed. And um, it was quite difficult actually to figure out what was the best program, programming language. So I even devised uh, a particular metric for this and it's called show us. Uh, and the metric stands for clueless has opinion about subject. And basically it's, I have a whole article about this if you want to, to dive deeper, but basically the more clueless people that are having an opinion about this programming language or how you implement stuff in the programming language, uh, the less likely I was to pick it. I wanted to find a programming language where I could easily find good quality information about how to solve problems within it. <clears throat> and uh, the choice came down to Rust. And Rust, uh, I don't regret this as, at all. It's a great programming language. It has a, a incredibly nasty compiler in the sense that it will punish you for everything that you do that is not correct and it's incredibly good at finding this out. Uh, so when you start working with Rust, even if you're an experienced programmer, you will feel like a, a complete and utter idiot uh, for a while. <clears throat> but once you get past uh, this uh, initial hurdle of fighting with the compiler, it is a great language, and I think it's, uh, it's going to flourish in the future. And a lot has happened also within Rust over the years that I've been programming this database. So, um, what's the theory uh, behind this database? Well, uh, the database is not a relational database. It's based uh, upon something different. And this different thing is called a posit. Uh, and it is sort of an atomic structure that you can use to capture a statement or a piece of information that you want to store in the database. And the intent of it is to capture some value that is appearing for one or many things at some point in time. Uh, we will look closer at this in just a second. Um, so the, the, the idea is not that difficult or complex. And, um, we use this single structure to capture everything that goes into the database, whether it be some attribute or something or a relationship or a classification, 
an opinion about something, everything is a posit. So it's just one structure for everything. And that makes it, of course, easier uh, when you work with uh, and, and want to build the back end uh, within the database because you only have to build something that manages uh, this single structure. And this is what a posit looks like. <clears throat> you have some, uh, the posit is the thing that's in the brackets. Um, we have something that is the actual posit thing, which is uh, sort of a, an alias or an identifier or whatever you want to call it. Uh, first on the left hand side, then you have a number of things uh, that appear with some role that they are playing in, in here, uh, some kind of value that is appearing and a time point that is when this value appears um, at the end. So this is what the atomic data piece looks like and what the database is working with internally. I made a proof of concept of this uh, early on uh, in a relational database, sort of as a layer in a related, uh, relational database. But um, like other technologies that I've been working on, for example, anchor modeling, um, it's also sort of a layer within your relational database that, that provide additional functionality that the relational database itself does not. And in this case, um, the relational database wasn't really good at, at managing these types of structures that you see in front of you. So, because there could be like a dynamic number of, of uh, things and roles involved. Uh, so the performance uh, kind of sucked in this uh, proof of concept that I built. Nevertheless, uh, I was able to test out uh, many different types of algorithms there. So it's been uh, quite useful anyway. It's also available uh, on GitHub if uh, you're interested in that relational proof of concept. Um, so <clears throat> we also need to introduce some terminology. So the combination of a thing and a role we call an appearance. Uh, all of these appearances taken together, we call an appearance set. Then you have this value, which we call appearing value, and the time point, which we, which we call appearance time. So if we look at uh, an example, uh, here we have a posit, and uh, on the left-hand side here, you see the identity of the posit, the identity of one of the things here, uh, the role this thing is playing, uh, another thing, and the role of that thing, the value that is appearing, and the time point when this value started to appear. Uh, and of course, this posit here is uh, a marriage. So this indicates that we have someone who is the husband uh, and someone is the wife. They are married since this point in time. And it's also, we have this identity of the posit as well, because um, if you think about what metadata is, metadata is data about data. So unless posits were things in themselves, we couldn't really talk about them. But by making posits things in themselves, we can start to talk about this P1 using some other posit. And we will see an example of that also later. So, um, when you have this, so the elements that you have in here that build up this posit, they can of course appear in other posits as well. It's quite possible for this very thing that you have here that we've named IDH is, um, could appear in many other posits. Um, this particular role uh, could also appear in other posits. This value could appear in other posits. This time point could appear in other posits. This whole appearance set can uh, appear in many different posits. And this is where you sort of can build a theory around this structure that we call a posit. 
So what does it actually mean when this identity appears somewhere else? What does it mean when an appearance set appears somewhere, somewhere else in a different posse? And I wrote a paper uh, on this, uh, which is also freely available on the anchormodeling.com homepage. So if you're interested in the actual theory behind this, you can download the paper and uh, read that. Um, and apart from being able to formulate a nice theory behind the posit, the very fact uh, that these things appear in many different places also give you uh, the ability to search in many different ways. Uh, you can search for all the posits uh, in which a particular thing appears, uh, all the posits in which a particular role appears, or a particular value, or a particular time. Uh, and the great thing about this is that uh, this is uh, much richer than the way you can, for example, do queries in uh, a relational database. So in this way, it, you sort of combines many ways of searching from relational databases, graph databases, name value pair databases. Uh, the POSIT uh, makes it possible to all, do all these types of searches. So you can search in ways that you haven't been able to search before. And of course, <clears throat> If you are going to search for information in the database, you need some sort of query language. Uh, and this being a, a non-relational database, it also means that the language is not SQL. Uh, SQL in itself is not rich enough uh, to, to uh, express all of these different new ways that you can search. So I had to invent a new query language, um, but um, I still wanted it to sort of be SQL-like. So because I think most people will come from relational databases and SQL to Bearclad if they choose to do so. Um, so having something that at least is somewhat familiar uh, um, will, uh, will help out. So the query language, uh, it's called Terracula, uh, Transitional Query Language, because the theory uh, behind posits is called Transitional Modeling. So Transitional Query Language, or Terracula for short. Um, we'll look a little bit at what this looks like. So here, it, <clears throat> here's um, uh, some Terracula statements. And first, uh, you have this statement called add role. Uh, so what you need to do in order to store posits at all uh, is to define the different roles that things can appear through. So here we define uh, roles and this is basically or very simply put the, the stuff that you absolutely need to agree upon preferably uh, universally, but I mean, at least uh, within your business, or if not that, locally, at least to your enterprise model or, or wherever it may be. Um, so you build sort of a vocabulary here of, of uh, the roles that you will be using when you store posits. Everything else basically is uh, built uh, upon this later. So this is what the only thing really you need before you can start to store information. So very little modeling needs to be done up front. Uh, and you can see that these are really not classes or classification. These are more similar to attributes or um, columns that you would find in a, a CSV file or something. Then we have the add posit statement, uh, which adds posits. Uh, and you can add several posits at once if you do a comma sign. So here we add a number of posits. And as you can see, there's a plus sign uh, 
here. We'll look at closer at uh, that uh, in a minute. Uh, and there's no plus sign there, so it's a small difference. But this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, and to go back to some terminology, you can see that the role that we defined up here for the wife is one that we use here. You cannot use a role down here that is undefined. So you need to define your roles first. Then we have the things. Um, they are the thing in blue here, which uh, has some aliases. And some examples of the time points. Uh, and what's left, the values, of course. But here I started thinking, traditionally, when it comes to values, before you store a value in a database, you have to also specify what type of value it is. However, the more I thought about it, um, the more it made sense that the database itself uh, could actually determine what's the best way to store this thing I see in front of me. And it's not that difficult to make the database smart enough to figure out a good storage format internally for whatever it is you're giving it. So Fairclad comes with something I call lookalike data types. So if we go back here and look at some values, this looks like a string and well, then it will be stored as a string. This looks like a really long decimal number. Well, then it will be stored as a really long decimal number. And as it turns out, Rust has some really great uh, uh, data types internally that you can use that are quite smart. And I also invented um, some own smart data types for time, for example. Um, but that helps. You don't have to really care about the, the defining the data types when you want to store information in BearCloud. BearCloud will figure this out by itself. And here you see this address here is specified uh, as JSON and BearCloud manages JSON data as well. So this will be stored internally as a JSON object. And you will be able to use some sort of JSON methods on this when you retrieve this information later. Um, also, if you noted, there was something here. There's some predefined constants as well. Uh, the smart time type uh, that um, I created for BearCloud uh, manages not just uh, different granularities of time, but also has support for some special time points, like the beginning of time and the end of time. I don't really know why there's never been a standard for that because that's something that you probably, I know I use, but usually you put 999-1231 or something like that instead of the end of time, uh, which is uh, sort of just a, a band-aid or a bad convention. Now, you may also have noticed that I never put in any unique identifiers or numbers or something for those things I was putting into the database. Uh, instead, you saw me use aliases, uh, IDH and IDW for the husband and wife. Those were just random variable names. You can choose whatever you want, but these um, aliases that you introduce they live during your query session and then they disappear afterwards. So if you look at this query here, uh, you have the plus sign over here. Uh, so a plus sign before uh, an alias means that I want to create or rather insert an identity into this alias. So here you create a new identity which is this IDW, and you create a new identity here for this posit. Uh, then you can recall this later 
to add additional information. So this is IDH, and this is where you created IDH. So this is the address of the husband in this case. And this is the age of the husband. Um, you can also, as you can see here, um, have plus signs for the same alias multiple times. So these actually acts as uh, arrays or vectors. So you can store multiple identities into a single alias, um, which uh, will help us, as you will see later. So looking at this slide, uh, we add some additional information uh, about the wife in this case. Uh, and then uh, also some more information about the husband. Then um, we add two new posits that are opinions. Uh, like I said, uh, information out there in the world, uh, the true nature of information is often opinionated. So Bearclad supports this, so you can add opinions about the posits. So in this case, you can see that we are referring to a posit and we are ascertaining this with some uh, certainty. Uh, and in this case, when it says 100%, it means that we are absolutely certain that this is the case, that whatever the posit is stating is true. Uh, on the other hand, you could also state here with negative certainty, that means we're absolutely certain of the opposite of what this posit is, is stating. And of course, any degree in between 100 and, and minus 100 is also uh, possible to state. So if, you're, if you think that something is quite likely, perhaps that's uh, maybe 75% uh, sure. So it, that's also possible to state uh, in this case. And uh, further down here, we can also add classifications. So here we add, uh, with a plus sign, we get a new uh, identity for something that we name person uh, since now. And um, this we connect to this IDW, that's the wife in this case. This wife thing, uh, we say that uh, it belongs to this class called person. And it does so since uh, the birth of the wife. Um, so it is possible to produce uh, the classification uh, as posits as well. So this is very different from how you traditionally do modeling, where you start by doing some sort of entity modeling, uh, core business concept modeling. In this case, you have the information first in the database and then you add classifications on top of that data that you have. And this makes it also possible to have multiple classifications uh, of the same thing. You can have differences of opinions about classifications. So you can build multi-tenant databases, if you like, uh, using this. And like I said, when you have uh, use the plus sign several times for the same alias, it will contain all of the identities that you've put into that. So in this case, P1 will hold five posit things. So uh, in that uh, assertion uh, where I ascertain this with 100% certainty, that will expand into actually five posits that are being stored into the database. And you heard me say assertion, and we have some terminology here as well. Uh, when you create these opinions, we call them assertions of posits. And that's an example of metadata. Any posit that contains a reference to a posit is metadata because it's information about information. Uh, and we separate this from the classification because as you can see the classification is done on instances or things themselves 
that you bind to a class. So in that case, there's no posit in there. Uh, the identities are the identities of, of regular things. So it's uh, information, but it's not information about information, but it's tending towards that anyway. So to differentiate this from, from data, we call this peridata or peripheral data. So classification is peripheral data and um, assertions are metadata. Bearclad will come with uh, some reserved roles. Uh, so posit, ascertains, thing, and class uh, are roles that you don't have to add yourself. Uh, the database will already understand these roles. So now that we've added uh, some information into Bearclad, uh, we want to search the database. And searching the database is uh, done through uh, some steps or uh, parts of your query, where the first part is the search part, where you actually specified, you specify what patterns you will want to match with your query. Then you have, a, uh, if you want to, a where condition where you limit uh, the results of this search. So you narrow it down. And finally, in the final clause of the query, you instruct the database, uh, what of all this that is matching would you like to retrieve in your results? So uh, if it's lots of different possibilities for columns and, and stuff, then you decide here at the very end that I'm only interested in these two things or, or uh, whatever it may be. So this is what the search looks like uh, programmatically in Tracula. And you do a search here uh, using a syntax that is um, sort of a pattern matching, regular expression-like uh, syntax. So in this case, uh, I'm searching for all the posits that has this structure of wife, husband, married, and at some undefined still uh, point in time that I want to keep track of. Uh, and they should still be married. The current value should be married. That's what the as of stands for. Then I also want to fetch uh, the posits uh, where the name corresponds. So this is the wife identity. I want the same identity here and pick out the name. And I want to store this name in this alias called W. And I don't care about the time. It can be any time. It can be any husband. But interestingly here, it says as of t. So this is a sort of a temporal join between these two because I want all of the posits of the people that are married now, but I want their names as they were when this uh, married appeared. So I'm backing the clock here to this point in time. So this posit I want to see as it was at this point in time, t. I'm also restricting myself to saying that I'm only interested in the ones that were married after 2001. So just to give an example of a where condition. You can aggregate information. So in this case, I will aggregate for these names that come, these values here. So I'm Aggregating for these values, I'm creating a new alias, which is the count of wives that have this name. And I'm returning the name and the number of wives that have that name. So this is a simple query, but it shows you what the structure of these will look like. And this is sort of where I'm at right now uh, in the implementation of Bearclad. All of the insert things that you saw work really well with persistence and everything, and, and you can start up the database and it will restore the information. Searching is where I'm working on the parser right now. Uh, 
and uh, my plan is to have this parser complete before the summer so I can release an alpha version of the database where you can do simple searches. But this is an area where I will continue to build and improve on this uh, search uh, uh, interface. So the idea behind BearClad is sort of to capture information more true to the true nature of information or reality itself. Uh, and the way we do that is to first figure out as few things as possible that you have to agree upon so that basically all of the other stuff is, is things that you can if you want to disagree upon. Uh, so compare to a relational database, BearClad has fewer things that you actually need to agree upon beforehand than the relational database does. And of course, BearClad do things that relational databases don't, uh, at least not internally in their database engine. Um, and finally, just to list a few things here, uh, because I'm talking about capturing reality, and there are things that you can never get a database uh, engine to manage. Um, for example, when we enter information into the database, this has at some point been subjectively determined. If it's a color of a jacket and it turns out to be orange, well, uh, someone will have determined at some point that orange is a good class, uh, is a good value for representing the color of this jacket by looking at it. Whereas maybe, I mean, someone else could have thought, well, I think it's yellow or I think it's red. So it's a subjectively determined value when it enters the database. Then of course, when you look at that value, when you, when you take it out of the database, and you see that it says that the jacket is orange, you will, you will get this mental image based on your experience of what orange is, of what this jacket probably looks like. So you also um, subjectively experience this value when you see it in front of you. And this is something that we can't get around. This is just the way it is. The database cannot manage this. And of course, reality is always going to be extremely complex and, and we can never capture everything that goes on when we enter information into a database. So it's still extremely limited, a very intelligently selected number of stuff that we put into the database, but it's a very limited still um, interpretation of reality itself. Now, if you want to uh, help out with this project, or if you're interested in just uh, downloading, compiling, or, or playing around with it yourself, uh, the whole project is open source. It's available on GitHub. The easiest way to get there is to go to bearclad.com, and you will end up uh, directly right now at the GitHub page. Uh, so this is what it looks like, and you can follow the development there. And with that, um, I would like to say thank you, and um, I'll leave you with this uh, final slide. Um, we'll, we are all aware that uh, there's some concerns right now when it comes to data warehousing and data modeling. Um, data warehousing uh, would probably right now get a, a, a low score on this metric that I devised called SHUAS. I think a lot of clueless people are having opinions about data warehouses. Uh, and uh, that's a topic for another discussion, but um, maybe uh, and hopefully BearClad can be something that might at least uh, change the opinion uh, a little bit uh, for some of you anyway. Thank you very much.